uh, from the title story of this book, Chez La Fa, and uh, it uh, involves a girl, a woman, young woman, it's an autobiographical collection, um, who's very bedridden, and she's lost her source of lunch. And so this is a story about this woman trying to find someone who can get her lunch every day because she's so bedridden. Um, and the owner, this female owner of an Iranian um, shop nearby, kind of figures out that something's going on and that, that this woman needs help. And so I'm just going to start in here. And I'm sorry, I'm pregnant, so I'm a bit out of breath, but nothing serious. <laughs> The next day, I was just out of the living room, on a mission to extract baked beans from a can, when the doorbell rang. I recognized the phone box before I recognized the woman. She kept her eyes down. I was wearing an Israel Just Do It t-shirt, a fun, sporty bootleg purchased in Tel Aviv's Carmel Market in 1990. In the fresh air, I smelled dog droppings, the smell of promise in this neighborhood, the scent of thaw. I can bring you lunch, she said, every day at noon if you like. You may alert me to any food preferences. She looked up to see my reaction. For all she knew, I was a mute in addition to being housebound and a supporter of gross human rights offenses. Just do it. Of course, I will pay you, I said. Yes, yes, certainly, at the end of the week is fine, she replied neatly, turning to leave. Under a forest green loden coat, she wore a neat beige skirt suit, the sort of outfit nuns wore on days off, except she had no head covering over her short hair. Thank you, I called out, a peculiarly Jewish brand of shame turning me yellow. A woman comes to my door as kindness incarnate, and I'm fanning bills. Samira's lunches became an outsized part of my week. Antoine, my husband, too busy moping or primping for nights out at the clubs, didn't ask about my lunches, and so I didn't tell him. I liked having a secret. I'd watch Samira walking her quick, poised walk as if she was running away from something, elegantly, every day at noon. My blinds were always pulled up then. Samira was maybe five years older than my mother. She'd studied medicine in Tehran in the 1960s. She didn't buy my excuse, something like whiplash, but didn't require anything more. After a few weeks, I offered Samira extra money. For coming all this way every day, I said. Don't be silly, she said, placing the folded bill back on my lunch tray with her long, calm fingers. I'm only a few doors down. The walk takes one minute. It was a Tuesday. She had bought me cherry juice along with my meat and rice. The juice came in a stiff, shiny sack that you pierced with a thin, specially angled straw. She swiftly punctured the pouch and gently placed the juice near that day's takeout box. I love the cherry juice, I said, licking my lips like a child making cutesy on a television commercial. Okay, she said, and glided out, passing my mother, charging across the street in stretch pants, yoga mat under her arm. My mother's steps reverberated through the house like a stampede. Where did you get that lunch, she asked, the store on the corner. You know they have some Israeli food there, labne and zatar. It's Persian food, Mom. Labne is Israeli food. No, Mom, it's Middle Eastern food. Israelis eat it because their country is in the Middle East. <laughs> I grew up eating labne. Yes, and if the Jewish state had set up shop in Sweden, you'd have grown up eating lingonberries. What does Antoine call that store? Chez l'Arab? They're not Arabs, they're Persians. Persians are not Arabs. You know, they were a very cultured people, the Persians, said my mother. Anyway, all the same now. Are you finished eating? Yes. Give me, I'll eat the rest. Oh, yoga was so hard today. I almost felt a migraine coming on. Still, your muscles feel so good after yoga, like your inner muscles. My mom said she had a class again on Thursday. It's just a flute a few blocks away from here. An Israeli woman gives them in her basement. A grain of rice flew out of her mouth and onto the wood floor. I stared at it. I'll come after, she said. I'll bring you your lunch. It's okay. They bring it. Who? The Persians? The Persians. Tell them not to bother on Thursday. I'll pick it up. Now, do I give them the money, or do you give them in advance? 
When I was 17, I brought a new boyfriend home. It was then possible to have 10 new ones in a year, but Tim must have been special because I hadn't brought the others in to meet my mother. Tim said he was half Iranian. Maybe if he had used the term half Persian, my mother wouldn't have looked up from her milky Nescafe the next morning, eyes still slitted with sleep, and said, as if weather reporting, Mamale, it's in their blood. Who? People like Tim. What? The hatred. <laughs> this was the woman retrieving today's saffron chicken, a woman who believed the Jews invented love. She'd be in the shop in her yoga pants, preening her nationality before all the taxi drivers in needless self-defense. It's in their blood. What? The hatred. She'd go into the store thinking, Iran. Iran wants to nuclearize Israel to bone dust. I was trying to telepath her the message. They left. Their daughter died in a fundamentalist jail. They never wore just do it headscarves in bomb camp. They're from the seat of culture in the Middle East. I had to keep my mother out of there. I fiddled with my bed controls. I flicked the side of the radiator over and over as if launching a fleet of miniature anti-mum fighting ships. I kicked <laughs> off a slipper in frustration and it flew across the living room and skidded under the sofa. Perfect. I was having a tantrum about my lunch delivery and now my foot was going to be cold. She made everything so complicated. <laughs> I ate in silence and my mother watched me. She bought this too thick mango nectar instead of the cherry juice that came with the strong little straw. I told her I was too tired to talk. She soon left. The next day, Samira didn't come. For an hour, I looked out the window for the neat suit carrying the white box. I saw people passing, walking their coffees and cell phones under high floating clouds, never looking up at the white wonders pushing together, pulling apart making and erasing holes of blue sky, nature always working so hard. I picked up the portable. The 411 operator said there was no listing for a store on Bourgeois Street. Are you sure this store exists? asked the operator. I dialed my mother's number. Mom, I have no lunch. I have barley soup and cheese bagel, she said. I'll be there in 10 minutes. After I finished eating, my mother took the tray away. I watched her attractive, heart-shaped bottom as she walked to the kitchen. If I get out of this, I thought, that's what mine will eventually look like. You know, she didn't know you had a mother, she said, clattering in the kitchen. The woman at Chez L'Arabe. She said she didn't know about me. I didn't answer. My mom brought me tea, a bag mingling with mint and a glass with a rolled paper napkin tied around its middle. Did you tell them at the store that you were Israeli, I asked. I told them I was also Middle Eastern, she said, and, and so they wanted to know from where, so of course I told them we are Israeli. Samira didn't come again. My mother brought my lunches, things she made, kugels and burekas. I saw the birds arrive in V's through holes in the doily clouds and a light in the park outside my window. I saw people taking their coffees for a walk. I saw ladies with strollers. I saw Samira sitting on one of the park's benches outlined by a low disk of orange sun. I saw Samira wave warmly. I saw my mother wave back. I saw two women who had made an agreement.